Hello and welcome to Tight Lines. With the closed season for coarse fish on the rivers of England and Wales beginning on Sunday, ironically mothering Sunday, many anglers' thoughts will turn to lakes and canals, or if they're purists, ladders and paintbrushes. It's really lucky that many stillwater species, especially carp, are switching on to feed, and I'm sure that top carp angler Ian Russell, who joins me in the body this week, has some great advice and tips for us to achieve better results with the scaly ones. And it's another Ian, this time of the Macmillan clan, who displays his skills on the banks of the Monument Fishery. He gets out to show us the best approach in the most difficult of conditions. I get out on the River Blackwater in Hampshire for a late season session targeting anything that swims and making the most of what's left of our time on rivers. And I'll also have this week's fishery focus with tips on what approaches are working best for all disciplines of the sport and how to get the most out of your sessions. Well, young man, welcome back. It's good to have you back in the body. Good to be here again. Yeah. How's things been going for you? How's the carp world treating you? The last year has been phenomenal in my fishing. So this year's a bit slow, but you know the weather's been all over the place. But the lot pr prior to that, fantastic year. You were telling me of, of one outstanding session, and, and in fact, I'll show you this picture. This is a picture of an outstanding fish. That was the best of 13 fish in 23 hours, and nine, that was 47 pounds. And the nine with it were also were all over 30 pounds. It's incredible. And, and, but that's not from a fishery you'd normally associate with big bags of fish, is it? I mean, you no. tell me where it's from. It's, where was it? It's from Kingsmead um, 1. On the RK Leisure Complex, it's incredible. No, you, I mean, you can go there and hope to catch one or two fish mm. in a 24, 48-hour session, but to, to get so many in the little bay I was fishing uh, just blew me away, really, and everyone else around. So. Well, it's one of the old Leisure Sport Cull Valley pits. Yeah, in, in, yeah it's on the Halton Complex. And, and it's never been an easy water, has it's it? It's not easy. I mean, you, no, you, can, you can get a few numbers throughout the season, yeah. but not in, a, not in a little strip like that. It was just in right time, right place. Yeah. And, but winter's been a bit tougher for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Being consistent this winter's been, been an absolute nightmare. Mm. But, you, you know, I adjust the, the fishing I've got to, uh, to catch fish. Instead of going for big ones, I go and catch carp, which, which mm. I love doing. And it's a great thing to do as well, isn't yeah. it? You know, it's no good sticking your nose in the air and saying, I'm not going to fish for one of those. But oh, no. You go, it keeps you tuned in, doesn't it? It keeps yep. you in, in tune, if you like, with what's happening on the hard waters. Yeah. You, can, you can base a lot on that. Well, you've always got your ear to the ground in case a little window appears and you yeah. can get over there and catch a couple. But I like to go carp fishing, I like to get bites. You know, yeah. for me, that's what fishing is. Fantastic. Now, we're changing temperatures, temperamental weather and fluctuating air pressure. This time of year can be an extremely difficult period for carp anglers and settling on an approach can be problematic. Earlier this week, we asked Ian McMillan to show us how he approaches a session when conditions are at their least reliable. And unreliable conditions are exactly what he got. Good morning and welcome to a quite blustery monument fishery in Shropshire. Last night was minus two. It's now a southwesterly blowing straight in our faces, hence why I'm wrapped up like an Eskimo. But we're going to talk about how to get a few bites when we're going from that late winter into early spring period, which we are now. It was 15 degrees on Saturday going into Sunday and then it was minus two last night. So it's not the time to be stowing loads in. You just want to put a bit in to get a bite. But I got here a couple of hours before the cameras and I managed to sneak one straight away. I got a bit of bait out in an area where I knew the fish had been over the weekend and I got a bite pretty much straight away. I'm spotting little enough and kind of like a match guy would do. I don't want to put a whole bucket full in. It's still not warm. Uh, you don't want to overfeed the swim. You know, we just want to try and nick, nick a bite, really, not feed them, just catch them. Uh, but this is the rig uh, that I'm using at the moment. I've had quite a few fish over the winter on it, and it's, uh, it's a rig called a multi-rig. It's very easy to tie. It's just a coated braid, a couple of blobs of putty to keep it pinned down. Uh, I use, that's a size 5 uh, chod hook, and it's a little 10 mil white sauce pop-up. Now, it's not the same colour as the spod mix, but the common thing that it's got to, with the spod mix is that you've got yellow of the corn, you've got half a jar of frenzied hemp, you've got little chopped up pieces of red ammo, 
and it's very, very visual. Because this is a pop-up, it's only anchored down with a little BB shot. As you can see the way it sits, that is exactly how it sits on the bottom. Quite aggressive, quite like a claw, and it's just, it's a great rig that's caught me a lot of fish over the winter, so I've got total confidence in it, and as you can see, it looks very, very carpy when it's sat over the, uh, the very bright spod mix. Right, what we're going to do now is we're using a, a well-known term in carp fishing called wrapping around the sticks. So you basically know how far out you're fishing by the amount of wraps you do around the sticks. So the sticks are four yards apart, which happens to be one rod length. So I'm fishing at 17 rod lengths, which is 68 yards. And my spot is clipped at 17, and my fishing rods are clipped at 17. And this is actually wrapped 17 times. So what that means is your rigs and your bait are in exactly the same position out in the lake. And it's a superb way of being very accurate and very efficient. You don't have to use a marker, you don't have to mark your lines. It's a really, really efficient way of being accurate and knowing exactly that you're fishing where you've put your free offerings. We're going to talk a bit about the actual gear that I'm using. And one of the main things that I've see a lot or a bit, got a bit of a gripe with to be honest is um, a lot of guys go over gunned now this the monument two it's it's about 10 to 12 acres now it's only 100 yards to the middle so you don't need to come to a venue like this with massive big pit reels and three and three quarter pound tesco over rods because they're just not needed you get a much better feel and a much more controlled fight with something like this i'm using a two and three quarter velocity rod and it's twinned with an x aero bait runner, a 10,000. And it's absolutely perfect. It, it's 12 pound fluorocarbon line. So I'm fishing it semi-slack, so you still get indication for liners, but it's still pinned down on the bottom enough. It's nice going back to where it all started for me with low test curves, small reels, rather than bigger test curve rods and reels. And it's, and it's just a joy to actually fish with. Conditions are bleak to moderate, I think, is the phrase I can use at the moment. Um, I'm watching the water because I'm watching for signs of fish, that's what I'm doing. Um, and I'm watching for coloured water. I've not had no liner, so I'll probably introduce a, probably another 10 spodfuls of bait in a moment, just to try and liven the swim up if anything's passing over. So just be aware of the conditions um, and don't overkill it. You know, once you put the bait in, if you put a bucket full in, you can't then take it out, little and often. Try and get a bite and build the swim accordingly. Uh, and try, like Ian Russell does, just go out when it's 25 degrees, he gets the good shoots and I get the minus two. So that's kind of the, the rule of thumb. I, I know the packing order, I'm sort of underneath in the packing order. <laughs> but we're trying, with fingers crossed we're going to get another bite. Now this is either hardcore, or insanity. The wind seems to be strengthening and uh, we've now got rain. We'll keep our fingers crossed again. There's always hope. While the rods are out, there's always hope. We've waited and waited and we've got another bite. You're almost trying to induce them to feed with only sort of six or eight spots of bait. And then we had a recast with both rigs just to make sure we got them bang on. And it's worked. These really soft rods into the row. When you get the fish close in, they're an absolute joy to uh, to play. Let's be honest, don't it? <laughs> Relief. There was never any pressure. There was never any doubt. 
Now here is the perfect way to end the show, Mr. Russell and Mr. Arthur. £27 of immaculate Monument 2 mirror. Um, fretting a bit, I will admit, uh, it wasn't looking great, but I am absolutely ecstatic to get this. Lovely day, horrendous conditions, but that is a proper chunk. For the conditions, I couldn't be happier. That was lovely. For me, they had everything that a Tight Lines film should have. Brilliant. Great instruction, bit of humour, and a cracking fish to finish off. And, and, and a lovely looking man. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll leave you to judge. Well, but but the, colours, the, the, the colours of those fish yeah. in wintertime, they're just gorgeous, aren't they? The water gets clearer, yeah. and they just show off their colours. Yeah. Marvellous. Great day out for him. Great yeah. day. I, I should think he's been in more friendly conditions, slightly less inhospitable, oh, because yeah. it wasn't very nice. But uh, and, and he, but he stuck at it, and, and you could see just how pleased he was. That oh, was the winning goal in the cup. When the bite off. occurred, yeah. he, he was well in when he wanted to explode, didn't he? But <laughs> he held himself together. He did. Well done, he. We've had a bite, and the fish is halfway, and he wouldn't <laughs> yeah. say it was a fish in case it came off. No, fantastic. <laughs> Welcome back, Carp Fishing Virtuoso. Ian Russell joins me in the body this evening. And is that the first time you've been called a virtuoso? And probably the last. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've got lots of things. Oh, you? yeah, God, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. Go on. Now, now, we're talking all things carp, and yep. we've got some stuff to have a look at here. But if you don't mind, I'd, I'd, I want to um, blow your trumpet a little bit more because I want to look at some more of yeah. these fish. And, and that, that picture is, is it's not the perfect picture to show, I suppose. But it, what it does demonstrate is the real size of these fish. I mean, we're talking about fish that weigh as much as a sack of potatoes, as it's a, a sack of, fish. almost the size of a sack of coal that yep. the coalmen used to deliver when I was a little boy. I mean, a massive, yep. massive fish. It's a great big fish, and look at it there. You can see the, the width of it, which the, you don't really get portrayed. You, you're right. other pictures. You, you, you don't get that. And, and then, you know, this is, this is a, a, a common. We've not seen a common this evening, and that, that's... I mean, they're glorious. I've got to say, I know that, that mirrors are often seen as the prize yeah. amongst carp angles because they're quite often a bit bigger. I don't know, yeah. But I, I, I like to see a good They're lovely. And, and this lovely. one's interesting because, you know, was this done for a, for a, a video or a yeah, feature? It was on a magazine feature. Oh, was it? Yeah, she made the front cover, that one. I should think it did as well. What, what size is that fish? Just over 40 pounds. <laughs> And that's it's a bit of a two-tone, isn't it, that one? It's yeah, I don't know why that is. I don't know. I mean, that, that particular fish is like it all the time. So. Is it? I, I think some of them are the, the famous two-tone, of course. Yeah, the, there you the go. The record fish. That, yeah. that was always that, that, that thing. And it must just be some kind of pigment, yeah, genetic it's, pigmentation Yeah, it is, thing. isn't it? I mean, I, you catch quite a few, like, not lots, but no. enough in a, in a year to... You know, they like it, and that's yeah. that, isn't it? I've had bream like it, and I've mm. seen tench like it as well. Oh, I've never I don't, seen tench. No, I, I've, yeah. I've seen tench. But I don't remember seeing, like, crucians or anything like that like it. But certainly I've seen very only a couple of tench, but yeah. I've seen lots of bream like it. And people say it's where they get their heads in the silt, but yeah. I just think I've it's... I've seen bream like it, to be it, fair, It's a pigment mutation, yeah. yeah. It's usually carp, isn't yeah. it, to be yeah. fair. Now, now, the goodies that you've bought in, first of all, um, sweet corn and, and like... Wait, sweet corn. What's, what's special about sweet corn? Well, this has played a massive part in my fishing in the last year. And, you know, a lot of the lads up at Oxford started using it to saturation point and catching such big bags of fish on the easier venues that I thought I'd take it with me to one of the harder venues and just see. There's mm. no reason why it shouldn't work. And first trip on Kingsmead with it was the best, best trip I've had all year. Like, you know, so. Over about the past five or six years, uh, it, it died off a bit last, this, this, this fishing year, yeah. if you like, 2014, 2015. Match anglers have been using sweet corn in what I would call almost destructive amounts. Yeah. I, I know that um, my pal Roy, Roy Marlowe's fishing at the Glebe. They were cupping in on pole gear right. a lot of corn at the start, or throwing it. They called it half mooning it at yeah. one stage because they were spreading throwing it. it like that, so it's spreading a half yeah. moon. And then every fish they would put in a full pole pot that big full of sweet corn, cup it in, drop in a bit of corn over the top mm. of it and catch one straight away. And they were using huge amounts. Are you using subtle amounts? Or I put in, on that particular trip, I was fishing two rods uh, either side of a weed bed at about 60 yards. Well, I put in five or six tins each side, went to the shops for a bit of lunch, come back, and they started getting bites. And every bite I had, I put another tin on top of the rod mm. that they spotted out on top of that, and they just kept coming. See, the, the great thing about corn with carp is it gets in their pharyngeal teeth, it goes straight through. It's yep. very easy for them to digest. Yeah, it's out. And what they don't, what they don't digest, like the skins, and it comes out the other end. Yeah. And and 
that's food for what follows on behind. That's so it's right, almost yeah. like it's creating... Well, the lake will eat it as well, won't yeah. it? You know, the, the, yeah. the silk creatures and that, so... Brilliant, brilliant year on that, though. Yeah, you know, I, just I, I no, bet it's it just being different again, isn't it? And in, in match fishing, it doesn't... It seems to work for two years, then it'll go off, and then it'll come back again. And, and people say it blows. I'm, I'm, I tend to think more it's water conditions. Yeah. But... Have you found a... Well, I got blows? away with that at Kingsmead, I think, because I was in um, a little bay. And if, uh, previous to that, a week before I'd gone to the little boilies in the open water and been plagued by bream, big bream as well, you know, oh, really? 12 to 15 pound fish. I think if I'd have fished that... Those it, well, I'll, I'll, give yeah. you, I'll tell you where they are. Yeah. If I'd have used that in that situation at the main lake, I think I'd have had the same result. But I got away with it in the bay because the carp were in there. I think the bream avoided it, and, and I got away with you. I think they used about 70 tins over a couple of, you know, over the day or so I was there. Wow. Which is loads, isn't it? I mean, it's about 20 kilos. Well, I'd, and I only had that in the van because I was going to France two days later with my son, so I'd picked up some bait to, to take to France. Oh, it and we used it all. No, it wasn't for me dinner. It's really called sandwiches. <laughs> I'd used a lot of the French bait, though, yeah. in, a, in a day and a bit on Kingsmead. So. That's really interesting. Now, I mean, my observations are that bream, although they'll eat it, aren't as good on big beds of corn as, as carp are, which is strange because the French anglers, French match anglers, use oh, yellow ground yeah, bait yeah. because the small fish won't go over it and the bigger fish will. Yeah. So because of predation Bizarre, from above, it? it makes them stand out. So, yeah, but, but I, I mean, I'm, if I'm fishing for carp and don't want bream, I'll leave out the pellets because yeah. I think pellets attack a lot of bream. But that's really interesting. Now, what sort of rig do you fish over that? That long shank hook there with um, this one. two bits of plastic. And a buoyant corn stop on the top. It sits off the bottom like a little block of flats, really. Hook lays on the bottom. Big hook, again, okay. which I love using. Yeah. And that was it. And that was sit as up simple as that. Like yeah. That, or no, just the hook's on the bed of the lake. The okay. And and the bait sits up. Now what you've got here, a bit of coated braid. That's oh there you see. There's the hinge, isn't it? That's hinged there to make it yeah. easy to come up. Yeah. And just no resistance, no putty here to no, hold it down. Or no, anything. it just balanced down lovely with the hook on the bottom mm. and the bait, you know, standing up. So what you, this is artificial corn. Do you use this with real corn or artificial? No, artificial corn. So you've got two bits of sinking corn yeah. and one pop And I never changed rig at all. I, I, it wasn't until the end of the trip that I realised I hadn't at, changed a rig at all. I had 13 fish on the bank, all with the same two rigs, and I hadn't changed them. Wow. So usually fun. you'd be sharpening hooks or yeah. others do, but um, no, I kept the same two rigs on. When the adrenaline is going, mate, they well, don't come off speed, today, no. you know, yeah, that's what right. I bought yeah. into it was, yeah. was speed. Now, this is interesting because um, we were talking just now over a cup of tea and you were talking about how you've, you've changed your fishing yep. a bit for your summer fishing yeah. and you now want to target, you, you, you like getting bites, but you want to try and pick out the bigger fish. And this is a rig that you've discovered through trial and error. Tweaking, luck, tweaking, really, you know. Um, it, it's a chod rig with a long shank hook, really. Yeah. Uh, I just think it's more aggressive. So do you, you, you fish it as a chod or you fish it like... No, I in... fish it with soft boom because... OK. The way I see it is if you're fishing a stiff boom and you land in a soft, the boom's going to stick out yeah. like a wand. Yeah. I like the soft stuff because also I, I, when, when I'm, I only ever cast that out over a baited area with two pop-ups in a bag which will hold it up. Yeah, yeah. and then when they, when they melt, that will fall in a coil. Now, most oh, of the fish yeah. I get on this rig, the swivel is beyond the lip and you need forceps, and it has to be something to do with that flying up further, wow. which is unheard of in carp fishing, yeah. to be fair. So I had fell upon something, but it was getting me, on average, much, much bigger fish. If I hold that there like that as well, you can just see that that looks like a pimple on a pig's backside. I mean, it's a, a tiny bait and a, and a great well, the hook's big hook. hook's right out beyond yeah. it, isn't it? And I don't believe for one second they're frightened of hooks. They don't it's know just, what hooks It's are. just me. I, it's my belief. Yeah, I believe As I know yours are. Yeah. But does the job for me. Now, when you say it, it's a chod rig, this little bit here obviously is tied up as a chod with the curb, yeah. the curve in, in that bit of material there. Is that... Is that it's £25 pound fluorocarbon. Oh, fluorocarbon. Stiff as I can get it. Yeah. I, I wonder what I'm interested in is, do you tie... That not first or last? No, last. <gasps> and because it's a ring swivel with the little ring on it, yeah, I find you can turn it back. Oh, you can put the swivel back yeah, through it, the You can get yeah. away with it. If it was just a swivel, I don't think you'd get away with it. And so do you fish this then, this boom, as a helicopter? No, nope, it's on a lead clip. On a lead clip? I rarely fish helicopters. And it's, as you can see, it's £20 soft stuff, yeah. £25 fluoro, and, and I always put it out there with PVA so it sits in a little coil. Yeah. Rather than being, because most everything else wants people want it. Yeah, they want to lay it out. And, you know, I've done this at open days in the tackle, various tackle shops, and everyone you show because it's such a big hook, you're almost mocked, like you know, until yeah. you're on the bank and it's working, yeah. and then people stroll up and 
then you're tying them up for people, which is really nice. And they don't drop off big hooks. They quite don't drop off big hooks. I'm a lover of big hooks, so, <laughs> yeah. I, so I totally believe they're not scared of hooks. Yeah, if, if you get one on it, you don't really want it to no, come off. No, they're coming in, aren't they, to be fair? Uh, just, just talk about the baits for a minute. These, these are your pop-ups, and I know that, I mean, I originally got to know you through, your, you were Lee Jackson's pop-up maker I at was, one time. Well, yeah, yeah I, was, I, I made pop-ups for a lot of companies yeah. and a lot of shops, I, yeah. you know. And these are... Do you make these or are these? No, these are made by a friend of ours. Oh, yeah. On behalf of the company I work for. Oh, yeah, yeah. But these are, I mean, these pop ups usually look a bit tidier than, than, than normal boilers, I think, yeah. because they have to be rolled slightly. Really. But they're extremely tidy. They're very round. And they've got, I mean, I would say it's a lovely smell. And from here, yeah. it is a lovely smell. Yeah. When I get closer, there's definitely fish in it as well. And, and these are. There is a percentage of, of fish in it. Caramelly, vanilla y, and. and, but, and Interesting and all, they're not fluoro, they're not bright. You know, no. the, my last year has got, other than the sweet corn situation, I've got away from the, the, you know, the real bright hook baits, and I've done so well on it, even as a single, brown pop-ups, you know, and, and mm. these sort of pale, sandy colour ones, I've done so well on them. And is that through the year or in the, in, in right the summer the calendar. More? No, really? right through the calendar, yeah. Because I, I always think that the bright baits work better in winter. I mean, in fly fishing, so, there's a saying, no, bright the day, bright the fly. Yeah. Because... The brightness gets through the water and emphasises the colours. In That's coloured water, then, isn't it? Exactly. Oh, yeah. In coloured water, you want a solid block of colour yeah. so it stands out in, in amongst the murky water. It's just but bizarre, it's, you know. I fished yeah. with Adam Penn in the other month and he oh, was yeah. under the same impression. We, it was quite a good conversation for once with us two together because we got <laughs> a bit mental. But um, no, the, and he had the same findings that the darker his bait in the last 12 months, the more bites he'd had. Really? Do you think in that, all situations. Do you think that's because bright baits are blown, or do you think it's a I don't know, evolution? you know, I, I, I think a lot of it is what you put your faith in, really, isn't it? And yeah. if I had used yellows, then I may or may not keep have had the same results. Yeah. But what I do know is I had good results using them, and that was that. And do you fish this over beds of bait, similar bait? Either or, yeah, either or. Well, you fish the boil is, I'd, I'd, I'd quite happily fish them over there if I thought bream or tench were going to be a problem. Really? So, yeah. That's it's fishing, isn't it? It's using what you're confident in. Yeah, that, that's, you know, confidence, I think, puts more fish on the bank than any amount yep. of flash baits and, and, and yep. special rigs and everything. If you're confident in what you're doing, you, you can almost wheel the bobbins up, or in my case, wheel the you, floating. You, yeah. or, or if you're not in the right mood for it, you talk yourself out of it. Don't yeah, you? so oh, yeah. It's a massive part of Tell it. Tell me, I've talked myself out of a few fish, I'm worried about Of course, fishing-wise, I had a great day fishing with Mark Pollard on Tuesday. You'll be able to see the outcome in a couple of weeks. We bagged up with decent skimmers on corn, and that's something that's happening on many other fisheries. We both agreed that hours of daylight are more important than temperatures when deciding if to fish the margins or not. Mid to late March is usually a good time to start looking down the edge for carp. Are, are, are you a, a, a believer in that, that light's more important than temperature? Yeah, very much so. Yep. Are, you, are you in the margins yet, or are you still...? Well, I, I, I was out fishing the other day, and the oh. only fish I caught was on, right across... It was a bright day, zigs, yeah. right across the other side, 100 yards across, where I saw one 25-pound fish, like, you know, so wow. they weren't in the deep stuff in the middle. No, no. It's but they would have been in the night, you know, that sort of just drift back across yeah. as, as it gets colder in the evening. Yeah, it, it, it's enthralling, really. I, I always find that this, this, this stuff so interesting. Now, what are your tips for carping tomorrow and Sunday? Bearing in mind that drop in temperature and that nasty... Did I mention there's an east wind? You that might have done a couple of times. I'd, oh, I'd yeah. always try and get behind it, to be fair, because if you're there for a couple of nights, yeah. comfort, you know, you want to be comfortable and all, didn't you, so... That is important. And you, you mentioned about confidence. Comfort is, is, is well, equally confidence, important yeah. as well, isn't it? You know, yeah. if, if you're sitting there freezing and shivering and shaking, you're not enjoying it, which mm. is what we go for, so... Mm. Would you be would you be baiting? Would you be using quantities of bait? Or I mean, the, the trouble... I've got this, this opinion, like many other people, if you put it in, you can't, you can't take, take it out. It out no. no. I, would, I would sparingly, if I was doing a couple of nights fishing, I'd quite happily put a few tins of corn and emp out. But bright, you took bright singles. I mean, we spent, mentioned earlier about the, the, the more... Drab bait. Yeah, but uh, I mean, if you were going, most people this weekend would be going to quite prolific venues, so a bright bait would score. Mm. So, bright singles, little bag of pellet attached to it, you know, always gets a bite. Those little it? PVA mesh bags are so important, aren't they? Because you're putting that, that little area of attraction. It's massive attraction. Yeah. And uh, straight to the hook bait. Yeah. Uh, are you a, a carp pellet man this time of year? I mean, a lot of people use halibuts and trout pellets. I always think they're a bit oily for this time of year. Quite difficult for the fish to Well, the thing is, you're not, you're not putting loads out, are you? I don't mm. use the pellet in the feed. It would be corn and M, maybe a yeah. couple of crushed boilies. But uh, I'd quite have to use carp pellets, trout pellets, mm. whatever. Whatever I've got in the van, to be fair, in just the bag. It's just <laughs> about getting a bite, isn't it? You're not feeding them, you're getting a bite. Yeah. So. Are you, I, I know there are a lot of, of, of bait companies that now make pellets 
to match the boilies. Yeah. Are, are you a user of that, or do you think the pellet's the pellet, and whatever I put pellet's over the, the top pellet. of it is a boil? You know, these are fish we're talking about, so mm. um, they're not overcomplicated creatures, are they? So, yeah. pellet, well, again, whatever I've got in the van. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they sleep, but they eat and do the other thing as well. But they this, do. I, I'll tell you one question I didn't ask about this Jordan. rig, and, and this is something that, uh, that I wanted to ask you. The connection into there, what do I do? It's a bait screw. Just grip the plastic thing and unturn the pop-up. There you go. How easy is that? That's, that's great, because I'll tell you what I don't like. I, I, I know you can eliminate it when you're using things like floss. Yeah. But I don't like to change the, the aspect of the bait, if you like. Yeah. I don't like to... If I'm feeding nice round, round boilies or pellets or anything like that, I, I'm, I'd rather lasso, for example, than use a pellet band if things, if things are tough. I use pellet bands yeah. if I'm fishing on the pole quite often. But on the waggler, I'd much rather use um, a, a lasso, except... Except I've got this little thing, this little rig I use that, that's based on a carp rig with a pellet band on it that works quite well. But this, these, these sort of the, the rig things... That is isn't it? Well, so easy. See, the rig things intrigue me, Ian, because you know I come from a match fishing background. I mean, you're, you're, you're similar to me, but you didn't stay yeah. in match fishing quite as long as no. I did. And, and I think that match anglers tend to be more baity yep. than riggy. And, and I've got this theory, you know, when, I, when I'm fishing match, especially when I'm fishing the tip in the winter... You know, we're always talking about, oh, I had a couple of liners and yeah. that went wrong. Now, a line bite for me is a nice, slow, sometimes doing that as the line rubs along the fish's back yeah. until it pings off as the fish goes. But if I get a sharp movement, anything... It's a bite. Even, only, yeah, it's a bite. It's a bite, yep. and the fish has got away with it. Yep. And, and I don't think, me included, I don't think the match anglers pay anywhere near enough attention. In all fairness to match anglers, they've, they've got a shorter... You know, amount of time, yeah. and it's feeding situations, and it? it's getting yeah. greed going, yeah. and then you're going to catch them anyway, aren't you? But if, if you were setting, if if you were now, you know, the old faces song, if I knew then what I know now, ooh la la. If you went back, don't we wish? <laughs> exactly. If you went back to match fishing now, yep. and you were fishing five hours with a method feeder or with a little bomb and a PVA bag or, or even a ground bait feeder, yep. what would your hook arrangement be? In all fairness, probably a small, a very short braid hook link, small hook, and. Uh, a little bit of plastic. Plastic bait? Getting bite, yeah, a little bit of plastic mm. corn and a method feeder with a bit of corn in it. I, I think that... Hair rig. Yeah. I mean, mm. Many fisheries and, and World Feeder Championship rules call for a minimum hook length. and A minimum oh, right, length. Yeah. There's yeah. got to be a minimum of 50 centimetres or 60 centimetres. Oh, wow, well, yeah. And, and that sometimes is quite difficult. It's all right for bream and stuff like that. But I, I, like you, I, I, I'm convinced oh, yeah. that short hook lengths... Mm. I, I've fished, I remember many years ago, I fished Dart Brooklyn's Lake, you yep. probably know, on, yeah. on, a, on a match, it was on one of the famous Dartford Opens. And um, a chap came up and, and he said, I hope you don't mind me putting you right, but I fish here a lot and this is my rig. And I looked at it and I thought, now he's got to be having a, a, a oh, laugh here. Because it's a short... He had a feeder yeah. and then it, a, 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 a hook tied above it so it was the same, hanging at the same distance as the feeder. Yeah. And it was a big hook, and it was tied to six-pound line direct. Yep. He said, now, I'll put a single maggot on that, and I'll catch bream, mm. but hang on to your rod. Mm. So I tied up it a rig... sense, doesn't it? Because he wouldn't go away. Mm. I tied up a rig to pacify him, and I did one bream in three and a half hours. Chucked the feeder out at the bottom, and I thought, well, I'll wait until he goes, and I'll put a proper rig back on. And I had to rescue the rod. And I had seven more <laughs> bream, and I finished up with 38 pound 12, tied with my mate Darren Davis, we were joint fourth. And I caught them all on that tiny hook length, big hook... 16, it's a big mm. thing. Yeah, it's, and a, it's, it's, with a single red maggot yeah. on, yeah. And, and, and that intrigued me, and that led me to believe that short hook lengths are, are really good. And I think sometimes that the method feeder works mm. so well. The feeder's obviously in some instances important, but I think that short hook length and that self-hooking aspect yep. of pulling against the, the, well, the, the weight... The of, method ball's brought the greed aspect into it, yeah. they're on it straight away, yeah. and you've got a tiny little hook length flailing around next to it. It's yeah. one of the first things to go, isn't it? So you, you would definitely go yep. short hook length, short as possible. Braided hook practical. length, a nice soft one, yeah. a hair rig. A lot of match fisheries, they're not allowed braided hook lengths, to be honest, because... Well, they, then it would have to be nylon, wouldn't it? Which, yeah. which makes it difficult then to fold back into your, yeah. your method ball, but then you don't need to, do you? No, so, no. It's, it's, it's really interesting. I, I love talking match tactics to carp I fish hangers. matches. I fish yeah. all the carp matches for years. I don't now because I've gone past that stage in my life, but I've fished them for years and years and years. And I've always done all right at them, to yeah. be fair, because of my match fishing yeah. youth. Well, all you've got to hope, mate, is that uh, the season that's coming up soon is as good for you as last year's because you had an absolute cracker. There's no doubt about that.
That's it for this week. Keep those young angler photos and questions coming in on email. And remember, you can find all sorts of information and features on our website. Why not follow us on Twitter as well? Mate, it's been a pleasure as always. Thanks Thank so you much very for much coming. for having me in. Oh, mate, it's lovely. Now, next week, my guest will be Andrew Alsop, who's skipper of the Whitewater Charter Boat, one of the most respected operators in the UK. Join us at 6pm on Sky Sports 3. That's skipper Andrew Alsop on next Friday's show, 6 o'clock on Sky Sports 3. Don't forget, we're also available on demand every week in the Sky Sports section of Catch Up. You'll find some other collections of our best films on there as well. But it's goodbye for now. Have a great week wherever you're fishing in tight lines. Thanks, mate. Cheers, Chris. Good stuff. Yeah, lovely. It's nice. Keep getting warm. Enjoy Sky Sports Live. On all screens, on the go, and the best bits on demand.